Okay, welcome everyone. On behalf of Governor Dugard and the South Dakota Department of Agriculture, I'd like to welcome you to the ninth annual Governor's Agricultural Summit. Uh, welcome, and my name is Maggie Stensis. I will be your Master of Ceremonies for today and tomorrow. I'm originally from Lakeville, uh, but I'm a jackrabbit. I studied dairy production and speech communication at SCSU. And I got to marry both of my degrees into this job as the Strategic Communications Officer for the Department of Agriculture. Um, and today, uh, we have a great program for you as well as tomorrow. Um, for this afternoon and tomorrow, um, it's been thoughtfully constructed to generate dialogue amongst South Dakota's farmers, ranchers, business and industry partners, and others involved in agriculture um, here in our state. Agriculture generates $25.6 billion, as I'm sure most of you know, of annual economic activity in our state. And it's so important that we take time every year to gather and discuss ways we can continue to promote, protect, and preserve this important driver in our state. I want to start uh, the day by giving a special thanks to our, some, our sponsors for their support. Because of their generosity, we are able to present this conference without a registration fee. This sponsorship re reflects the substantial value these businesses and organizations place on relationships and strategic discussions that grow during the Governor's Agricultural Summit. Please join me in thanking our sponsors for their generosity. And as we begin this afternoon, I want to remind everyone that is joining us online to tweet questions if you have them for our panel. Our Twitter is at um, SD Agriculture, and please use the hashtag SD Ag Summit. Um, we'll have the questions when we have a question time during the panel. We'll be able to ask them uh, right here, and you'll be able to interact. So now we're going to jump right in and hear from our interim secretary, Dr. Dustin Odekoven. Um, Dr. Odenkoven has served as our interim secretary since July 1st, so he's been in it quite a while. <laughs> um, he leads our state in more than one capacity. He is also our state veterinarian, um, and as well as the executive director for the South Dakota Animal Industry Board. Uh, he grew up in rural Meade County, where his passion for agriculture was cultivated through 4-H and FFA. He graduated from Sturgis Brown High School before attending South Dakota State University for his bachelor's in agricultural science and received a doctorate of veterinary medicine from Iowa State University. Dr. Odekoven and his wife, Jen, live in Pierre with their five children. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Odenkoven to the podium. Okay, thank you, Maggie, thank you. Um, well, welcome everyone to the uh, 2018 Governor's Ag Summit. And um, you know, what, uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to be here today. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate to be involved in a number of past Ag Summits, and uh, this one I had fairly little to do with as far as the planning, so, and I feel like I'm new enough in my position, I've just been uh, with, uh, with the department here for about a week that I can still step back and say, you know, I really want to thank uh, all of the department staff for the work that's gone into this. So if you'll help me uh, recognize the Ag Department staff for the work that's gone into this summer. <laughs> well, we are excited to be here in Rapid City this year. Uh, the summit's bounced around from, from different uh, areas across the state. And uh, as uh, Maggie mentioned, this is pretty close to home for me. I grew up just uh, almost 25 miles uh, straight north as the crow flies. and. Uh, so it's fun to be back in, uh, in Western South Dakota and, and host the summit here. Um, I, and I know a lot of you, a lot of, you know, we've worked together over the years. I've uh, spent 15 years with the uh, Animal Industry Board and uh, have had an opportunity to uh, uh, be in this role in an interim uh, position in the past. So hopefully I do a good enough job this time, they'll let me out of it next time, we'll see. So, uh, well, uh, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about are, are really things that have been ongoing by the department staff, and uh, so I'll give you a quick overview of what, what the department's been doing. Uh, last summer, the department began a strategic planning process, and uh, how many of you have been through one of those before? Got a few of you in the room? Okay, so some, some of it can be uh, challenging, uh, fun to see where that process leads. 
Uh, with an organization as diverse as the Department of Ag is, having a strategic plan uh, has helped us in making sure we are all on the right path and are headed in the right direction. Uh, the first part of the process was establishing a vision statement. And the vision statement provides the end goal that everyone is working for uh, so that they can all work together. So the vision statement, as you can see uh, on the screen here, the South Dakota Department of Agriculture is a valued partner committed to serving a thriving, diverse agricultural community in order to enhance the quality of life for all and ensure a lasting legacy for future generations. Next, uh, the department established a mission statement. Uh, how many of you put together a mission statement before? It's challenging, okay? Hard to sit down and figure out what is our mission. Uh, the mission that uh, was settled on, as you can see uh, up here, to promote, protect, and preserve South Dakota agriculture for today and tomorrow. Um, finally, the department identified and stated values that help guide us in our day-to-day -day direction. And the values are listed here. Integrity, uh, we will maintain steadfast credibility established through professionalism and transparency while always displaying the highest standard of ethics. Customer service, uh, we will have consistent, timely, and professional interactions with our coworkers, our partners, and everyone we meet. Support, we will be an accessible and knowledgeable partner within our role as a state agency. And finally, stewardship. We will ensure a lasting legacy for future generations. So taken together, this vision, mission, and values have given the department a framework to ensure that we're all working towards the same goal. And as that process unfolds and we continue to work together on, uh, in, on implementing that uh, strategic plan, uh, I look forward to seeing some, uh, some good results for the department. So to give you a quick overview, the department is, is very diverse, as I mentioned. It's uh, comprised of five divisions. We've got ag services, ag development, resource conservation and forestry, wildland fire, and the state fair, um, or some people call the most fun part division. No, I, actually nobody's tell, called it that, but we think of it as that. So uh, really a fun and uh, diverse group to work with. Uh, there are a lot of things going on on any given day uh, within this department. And then uh, we also have the Office of the Secretary uh, that helps uh, keep things uh, uh, coordinated. Uh, so the department also works with a number of boards and commissions, uh, one of which I'm real familiar with and uh, several others I'm, I'm getting more familiarity with. So I want to take a few minutes to highlight some of the uh, things the department has been working on. So first of all, mediation. Uh, the department through the Ag Services Division facilitates mediations on agricultural loans from across the state. Uh, this is a good barometer to show how the ag economy is doing in the state. Uh, this chart shows the requests uh, that we've received for mediation and mediation sessions that have been held over the past several fiscal years. And for the most recent fiscal year, uh, the department received 245 requests for mediation. Uh, not, a, not a record we you know, look forward to, but a, but a record year for, uh, for services provided by that uh, division. Uh, 95 mediation sessions were held, and as the numbers indicate, this past year was not an easy one for livestock and uh, uh, crop producers. And so if you or someone you know uh, needs mediation services or would benefit from those services, be, feel free to visit with our Ag Services staff uh, for more information about that uh, or visit our, our website at sdda.sd.gov. Emerald ash borer arrived in South Dakota in uh, May in Sioux Falls. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about emerald ash borer. We've been hearing about it in other states for several years now. Uh, I'm uh, no stranger to uh, three-letter acronyms for, for uh, invasive diseases. EAB, though, is one I haven't thought of before really a lot. You know, I've heard of it. But uh, this pest attacks and kills ash trees and has done significant damage in communities across the United States. And today, ash trees make up uh, one, uh, one third of community street and park trees in South Dakota, so a significant number of those. Uh, in addition, it makes up 40% of the trees in South Dakota windbreaks and is the second most common species uh, in the native woodlands. And for these reasons, the department, through our Ag Services and Resource Conservation and Forestry Divisions, is working with, hard with federal government, other state agencies, and local communities to prevent further spread of the emerald ash borer. Uh, there's currently a quarantine in place in Minnehaha County, all of Minnehaha, Minnehaha County, the northern part of Lincoln County, and the northeastern corner of Turner County. Uh, this quarantine uh, prevents uh, movement of certain materials that uh, are you know, 
possible as sources of spread of the emerald ash borer outside of the quarantine area. One of the most common ways that that uh, pest is spread is through the movement of firewood. And so you'll see the signs everywhere, and this is another reminder to uh, only purchase firewood in those areas where, there, where it uh, is going to be burned, not to spread that out of the quarantine areas, and really not to move uh, firewood, uh, just buy it in the area that, it, uh, that you plan to burn it in. Um, <clears throat> And if you live in the quarantine area and you have trees, ash trees, there are a number of options available from treatment of those trees. You can do preventative treatment. Uh, you might consider removing the trees depending on the condition that it's in. Uh, we've been working with uh, other departments in uh, Pier to assess the, uh, the capital grounds and uh, determine what to do, uh, even though that's a long ways from the area where the emerald ash borer is now. But uh, those types of planning processes are going on throughout the state. Uh, and uh, it's never too early to be thinking about uh, protection from emerald ash borer. Um, and if you're interested in finding more information about emerald ash borer, you can go to, uh, there's a uh, website, emerald ash borer in South Dakota, .sd.gov. Moving on to our wildland fire division, uh, you know, we're fortunate this year the Black Hills has gotten a significant amount of rainfall, as I'm sure many of you have especially in the local area, have appreciated. But uh, even as we took our tour today, you can see how green and lush things are. So fortunately, it's been a quiet year, uh, quiet fire season. Uh, and uh, our, our firefighters that we work, at, work with across the area uh, have been farmed out to other areas, uh, nine other states, including Wyoming and Colorado, where there's some significant fires burning in those areas. So uh, we're thankful for the plentiful moisture and uh, protecting our local area and um, uh, being able to send our firefighters elsewhere for the, for the fire season. For several years now, the department through the Ag uh, Development Division has been working with counties to develop uh, and identify potential sites in those counties that could uh, fit various ag development uh, projects. Uh, it's exciting to see these new projects coming in from dairy expansion to uh, uh, poultry uh, expansion, swine businesses coming in. Uh, a lot and, and, and processors of all kinds. So that's all very exciting. It also creates some growing pains in some cases in those counties. And so this county site analysis program uh, uses GIS information to identify potential sites where these counties may um, use to make informed decisions about the types of development that they want in certain locations in their counties. So the county site analysis program has been uh, very successful with uh, 57 of South Dakota's 56 or 66 counties requesting to participate. And you can see that uh, 56 of those 57 studies have been completed and the results have been shared with those counties. Uh, I can recall past uh, ag summits where we had discussion on these type of things and had some of these companies talking about the challenges that they encountered when uh, trying to meet local county zoning ordinances and, and, and um, I think this tool has been a, a, a real effective way to assist the counties in identifying those areas and, and try to alleviate some of those concerns. As we look ahead for the rest of our summer, uh, I want to invite all of you to the 2018 South Dakota State Fair. Uh, as always, we're really excited about uh, the fair and the work that's gone into that. We have some great entertainment like Toby Keith, uh, lots of livestock exhibits including 4-H and open class. Of course, the carnival rides uh, and many opportunities to learn all about agriculture in South Dakota. Uh, the fair runs this year from August 30th to September 3rd at the state fairgrounds in Huron. Um, one event at the fair that uh, I'd like to highlight is the uh, Century Farm Program. Every year, the Ag Department partners with the Farm Bureau, South Dakota Farm Bureau, to honor and recognize farms that have been owned by a family for 100, 125, or 150 years. And so the recognition ceremony for those Century Farms uh, will be on the morning of August 30th at the State Fair. And if, uh, if you're around, be sure to stop by and uh, be a part of that. Listen to some great stories about those long-standing South Dakota farming operations. Um, and uh, here's, here's some of those stories. If you think uh, your operation or farm that you know about uh, might qualify for that, I'd encourage you to uh, check the requirements and uh, get an application uh, from the South Dakota Farm Bureau's website. Getting back to the schedule for today and tomorrow, uh, I'm really excited about the agenda that the, the department staff has put together. I think we've got some really good discussions ongoing. Uh, we've got four panels so that will be presenting some timely topics in agriculture uh, in South Dakota, including market updates, uh, innovative ways to use products locally, forest health, and uh, pollinators. 
Uh, we, saved the, the, we saved the sting for last. Okay, sorry, that wasn't on the script. All right, I'll, I'll stop doing that. Uh, Governor Dugard will be joining us tomorrow uh, as the moderator for the pollinator panel, and I can guarantee he'll, he'll have some of those, uh, you know, one-liners, those zingers. And uh, at the luncheon, uh, he'll also present Roger Scheibe with the Ag Ambassador Award. I was supposed to give that name away, right? Is that okay? All right, okay, good. Uh, and of course, none of this would be possible without our generous sponsors, uh, and so we've got them listed up here, and I'll just read them briefly. And uh, uh, the Farm Credit Services of America, South Dakota Ethanol, Sanford Health, First Dakota National Bank, BNSF, Bank West, and Monsanto. So please uh, help me once again in thanking our sponsors. And thank you again, uh, all of you, for being here. Uh, I know uh, sometimes it's tough to take a day out of uh, all the activities that you've got going on. I uh, appreciate you helping to make uh, the uh, Governor's Ag Summit a success. Thank you. much, Dr. Odekoven. Um, so as producers and business people, we know that there are many challenges within the current agricultural economy. And our first panelist will share with us the challenges and opportunities in this tough ag economy. We're happy to welcome back Dr. Matt Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts is founder of the Cremantle Group. He is a native of Bolivar, Bolivar, Bolivar. <laughs> uh, Montana and has worked in the Office of Chief Economic, is, yep, Chief Economic, <laughs> Economics at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and at The Ohio State University. Got the the in there. Our next uh, panelist is David Widmer. He is an agricultural economist with agricultural economic insights, specializing in agricultural trends and the farm economy. Previously, David was a researcher with the Center for Commercial Agriculture at Purdue University and an economist uh, with Kansas Department of Agriculture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Roberts and Mr. David Widmer. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me out. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. I actually grew up not too far from Dr. Roberts in eastern Kansas. Uh, I think this is the first time we actually met, so we traveled all the way to South Dakota to meet. Uh, but I always enjoy getting back to the Great Plains states. I spend most of my time in the Corn Belt, and I enjoy getting back. I grew up on a farm in eastern Kansas where we raised wheat and, and cow-calf operation as well. So it's always great to be back to see the small grains and the livestock producers as well, the cow-calf producers. So it's always great to be here. Uh, happy to join you today. We're going to talk a little bit about my observations of the agricultural economy, what I see as challenges, and what I see as a few opportunities to keep in mind as uh, 2018 sort of wraps up and we start thinking and planning for 2019 and beyond. Uh, most of this uh, information and, and, and graphs that I'll be sharing today uh, can be found on our, my website, uh, ageconomist.com. Ag we co-launched this in 2014 with Dr. Brent Gloy. He uh, was on faculty at Purdue University at that point. Now he manages his family farm in western Nebraska. He has irrigated corn and soybeans out there. So we have a weekly blog post. I uh, invite you to visit the website, check it out, follow us. Uh, they always say a picture is worth a thousand words, and in our case, a graph is always worth a little more than a thousand words. So uh, all the graphs that you'll see in here with the watermark have a, a post that really dives into some of the trends and observations that, that we see. So before we start to dive in, we want to step back and talk about what happens in the agricultural economy, what happens uh, over time. We sort of see these uh, cycles, maybe for the lack of a better word. Uh, we see these eras of, of booms and eras of slowdowns and moderation. So this is an image that we put together, and I'll show you the graph that in, it underlies it and supports it here next. But we, we've identified five or six periods that are important to keep in, 
in mind for agriculture. The first period are uh, stable periods. These stable periods have pretty constant or consistent net farm income. Uh, commodity prices are pretty stable. Farmland values and cash rental rates are fairly stable. Everything trends higher, but at a, a pretty slow rate from year to year. Uh, commodity prices are also pretty stable. And then we get into these boom eras. And what happens with the boom era is there's two ways that you get higher commodity prices in uh, economics or in agriculture and go back to our supply and demand uh, curves. So we have what we call supply responses. And supply responses is whenever there's some sort of hiccup maybe in the weather. And the way you have higher prices from a supply response is you have drought. And those usually cure themselves in about a year because we get some response in, we plant more acres of wheat or more acres of corn and soybeans the next year, and we solve that low ending stock situation, the prices moderate. But if you really want to have a boom period, you got to have from the other line on that supply demand curve, a demand shock. So typically we have demand shocks, and that gives us a prolonged period of strong net farm income, strong commodity prices. And then during this period, we have a second response. Not only do we have a boom in commodity prices, and a boom in net farm incomes, they last over several years, but we expand the size of the factory. The agricultural factory in the U.S. and around the world gets bigger. And how do we do that? We add more acres. We always talk about farmland being a, new, a good investment because they're not making any more farmland. Well, that might be true from a physical rocks being converted into soil and, and, and uh, organic matter standpoint, but we actually, over time, uh, have seen a couple errors when we bring in large acreages of production, maybe in here in the U.S. or in South America or in the former Soviet Union. And we'll talk about that as well. But then we have this supply response that's too great for the demand that we've built up. Commodity prices get pressured. We see a drop in commodity prices. This is this um, margin squeeze. Profits get really tight. This is not the fun period. This is the period that we've been in for the last few years. And what we see is fixed costs come down, variable costs come down, there is some stabilization in the commodity markets, a bit of a recovery, and then we return back to what we call the stable period. Okay? So let's go back a little bit. What was the last stable period that we had in agriculture? Most of the 90s and early 2000s. Corn was about $2 a bushel across the U.S. If it got a little worse, LDP would kick in. Anybody remember LDP, uh, the Loan Deficiency Program? Uh, Farmland values trended higher, but it was pretty slow. There wasn't a whole lot of uncertainty from year to year in the crop budget. You can pretty much take last year's performance and, and replicate it. And we had a couple supply shocks in there, right? 96 was a, a big year as well. 2002 and 2000, well, 2004, we had a really big crop, so really low uh, commodity prices. But that was really the last boom period. Those last quite a bit of time. Uh, excuse me, the stable period. And then that boom, that boom that we had, uh, was what we saw from ethanol and uh, exports to China, global exports as well. We'll talk a little bit about that more. And right now we're in this margin squeezed era. We see net farm incomes, cash rental rates adjusting lower. And then we'll talk about what it might take to get back to that recovery period. So here's the uh, chart. This is real or inflation adjusted net farm income going back to the 1930s. This is actually back to 1929. And there's a couple lines in here that run horizontal. The first one is an orange. That's that long run average. So that's almost 100 years of data there. It's the average of that period. The top black line is one standard deviation above. That's a statistical measure above uh, the mean and one, one standard deviation below. Anytime we get above the black line, it's a good time in agriculture. Anytime we get below the black line, it's a really tough time in agriculture. So there we see here there's kind of three big booms going back to the 1920s. The first one was post-World War II, whenever we had strong uh, economic growth here in the U.S. and Europe was rebuilding from uh, the many years of war on, on uh, their farmlands and in their countries. The second one was there in the 1970s, and the, uh, of course, uh, it led to the farm financial crisis of the 1980s. And now here we are following up on that previous boom. The current boom actually was not as uh, strong as what we saw in the 1970s when we adjust for inflation in terms of the peak. But what really helped this time around uh, was it was a long, a long duration. Again, there were sort of three elements to this recent boom that are really important to keep in mind. Ethanol got a lot of the headlines. Uh, it probably got two-thirds or 80% or of the, the publicity. 
The second one we had is we had pretty crummy yields in 2011, 12, and 13. Of course, 12 was a big drought, but we were below trend for several years there. We've now kind of gone to the other way, right? We've had a lot of years of really strong crops. And the third piece of this is actually uh, strong exports to China for soybeans and just a big, uh, strong, robust trade economy for agricultural products. Uh, and that really led to this sort of sustained, longer uh, strength here in this farm economy. Of course, net farm income now is almost 50%. The, the, bad, the bad news here, the headline that they usually write is the farm economy, net farm income is about 50% lower. Again, this is across the whole U.S. What we saw just a few years ago when it peaked in 2014, uh, but we're still hanging in above that black line. Uh, that black line, is, again, is that really bad period. So we haven't dipped below what we saw back in 2002. Uh, it was a pretty bleak year in 2002. And then, of course, in the 1980s, we had several years below that uh, lower black line. So I mentioned to this earlier about this boom, and there's a supply response. And here's the graph uh, that supports that. And it's global acres. And we've seen two big periods in history where global acres, and this is primarily 13 crops that are harvested around the entire world, uh, and, and this two big periods here that we've seen expansion. The first expansion happened in the 1970s. Of course, we saw these correlate with these big peaks in net farm income. So in the 1970s, early 1970s, the Russians had a really tough drought. It was a prolonged drought, and they were running out of wheat. And the world really didn't know, this was the Soviet Union at this, at this point, high of the Cold War, and the world didn't know how bad the situation was. And the Soviets came to the U.S., and Henry Kissinger was part of this, and they negotiated a deal where the Russians could come in and buy some wheat. Anybody remember this story? And over about a two- or three-month period, the Russians bought in one year what we thought they were going to buy in three years. And the commodity markets panicked, and net farm income spiked, and we were looking for a supply response. The story and the headlines were the Russians stole all the grain. So we thought we had it all figured out, but they bought way more than anyone had expected. The, we had, had no idea how bad uh, the crisis was there in Russia. So a famous ag economist who was then Secretary of Ag, he was a dean at Purdue University, he was actually the first person uh, to get their PhD in ag economics from Purdue University. His name was Earl Butts. In the early 1970s, uh, Secretary Butts at this point uh, helped rewrite uh, farm programs. Farm programs before the 1970s were a lot of supply management. And they sort of opened up and relaxed that and went to more of a market base. And during this time when the Russians had came in and stole the wheat, we had tight ending stocks and strong prices and strong net farm income. Earl Butts, Earl Butts stood up and what did he tell U.S. farmers to do? Plant fence row to fence row. And this is where we saw this sort of first big jump in the U.S., from 1.8 billion acres all the way up to 2.1 billion acres, a 300 million acre increase in global acres harvested here in the U.S. and across the globe. So this was sort of a U.S. Uh, effort here, and it also magnified across the entire globe. And here's the important part about these acres. What happened after the 1970s boom in the farm economy when things got really tough in the 1980s? Those acres didn't go away. So I called it earlier the global factory, and that's kind of what it is. If, if uh, Ford or GM are going to build a new factory, that factory pretty much stays in production forever, right? It's pretty rare that they ever take one of those out. It's very similar in agriculture here. After we hit 2.1 billion acres, we really didn't back off that. We kept that, those acreages in production. And even when times were really bleak in the 1970s, we didn't see much change. Actually, this little blip right here, that ticked down, uh, that was pretty much the U.S. Uh, trying really hard to manage supply. And we got that PIC program, the Payment in Kind, some of you guys might remember that, and the CRP program came in and, and took up about 30 million acres of production in the late 1980s. So let's fast forward a little bit. 2.1 billion was the benchmark. Now we've seen another expansion here in the last three years. The good news, in my mind, is that we've only increased about 249 million acres since 2000. It's a 12% increase. So the increase hasn't been as big in absolute or relative terms this time around than what we have seen in the 1970s. Uh, we've also seen a couple years here where it's about 2.3 billion. Um, I think an important sign about where the ag economy is going to go is what happens with global acres. And I think there's a lot of good news here that that hasn't expanded. 
that expansion seems to have slowed down. Maybe we're going to settle in here at 2.3. South America, of course, was a big source of this increase, 78 million acres. How many people, this is from 2000 to today, how many remember when 78 million was a big soybean crop to be planted in the U.S., or even a big corn crop here in the U.S.? So South America added the equivalent of about a U.S., entire U.S. soybean crop to their uh, acreage base. Sub-Saharan Africa, 60 million. The former Soviet Union coming in with a lot of wheat here in the last few years. Eastern Asia, and of course, uh, we don't ever see much of a decline in this over time. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here and talk about these demand. Uh, this is, Dr. Roberts and I had dinner last night, and we were talking about uh, soybeans in China, and he pointed out this great study that we think about, you know, the factors for that commodity prices to get strong, and a lot of the credit gets put on corn and ethanol. And he's pointed out a study that actually shows the acreage impact from this demand surge, this, this boom in the farm economy, uh, about twice as many acres, uh, the, the response, twice as much of that went to soybean acreage, then it went to corn acres. So uh, soybeans might actually be, or actually are, on an acreage basis, sort of a bigger swinger or a bigger driver in this farm economy boom than uh, ethanol and corn on a, on a basis. So this chart has three lines on it. The first two are consumption and production. So you can see here in yellow is the production of soybeans in China. This has stayed pretty flat over time. In 2004 and 2005, though, the gray bar shows consumption. And before that, production and consumption were pretty much locked together. In China, in, the, in the 2004, 2005, let that separate. And how did they take, make that happen? Imports. They said they could rely, they decided they could rely on the global economies to help them. And so you can see that they have just really outpaced uh, production. And today, the green line shows this, they account for about six out of 10 soybeans, the globe the global economy's import. So 60% of global imports of soybeans go to China. This has been a really remarkable story in agriculture. It's going to be a really important part of the story of where we go in the next few years. Because, uh, of course, what's going on now with tariffs and soybeans in China, this is sort of back in the fold here. Uh, and this is really an important part of that story. Of course, here in the U.S., we saw a big uptick in soybean exports. This is uh, the metric tons we used to... Uh, about 30 million metric tons, and now we're up to almost 60 million metric tons, so almost doubling of our soybean exports in the last decade and a half or so. And in 2016 and 2017, about 50% of our production uh, went for exports. So uh, thinking about those booms and where we are in the farm economy today, I can show you a lot of graphs about debt repayment capacity or uh, debt service ratios, but there are three key metrics I think are important to keep in mind. It's net farm income. Uh, debt and asset values. And for any business that you have, you want your assets to go up, your income to go up, and your debt to go down over time. But unfortunately, we've had a bad slide here in the farm economy. We've seen net farm income trend lower. It almost got to, uh, um, this is on an index basis, almost double what it was uh, in the early 2000s, but now it's actually below the 2000s level. So it's getting a little bit tough. And we've actually seen uh, total assets plateau and total farm debts peak. And the good news is that total farm debts are starting to come down slowly. So that's actually, total debts are starting to come down a little bit. That is some relief for producers. So unfortunately, the big trend over the last few years haven't been positive for farm economics or farm finances. Uh, but we hope uh, there's been some improvements maybe in the last year. Uh, that's the good news, but we'll see what happens over the next year and a half or so. One of the uh, points I think it's always important to make is that impacts vary across the U.S. So we look at uh, this chart in particular. Anything that's green has had more than a 100% increase in net farm income during the boom. So that's doubling. And you can see that South Dakota here is at 116%. So during the boom years, so 2000 to 2013, compared to the early 2000s, net farm income here in South Dakota more than doubled. Uh, Nebraska and Kansas were a little bit stronger, but big strength here in that farm income in the Corn Belt and the Northern Great Plains. But not every state saw that. So all the reds here, are there in the south, is actually a decrease in that farm income. A lot of this thinking about cattle and drought here in Texas in the past, and then a lot of uh, livestock here as well, and feeding of livestock here as well in the southeast. So just as we saw differences in the boom, 
across different states. Not everybody feels the same thing. We have the same thing at the county level within a state, and then the same thing across neighbors in the same community. So spent the first half of this talk talking about the big level trends at the national, but it varies at the individual uh, specific level. This is a change in farmland values uh, between, or uh, yes, farmland values during this boom period. And you can actually see uh, South Dakota, I can't actually see it really right closely, but it's more than a 300% increase in farmland values here in South Dakota. So from early 2000s to the boom, South Dakota actually saw the largest increase of any state in the US. So this was really sort of ground zero for this strong farm economy boom. I'm sure a lot of you notice that if you're going to farmland auctions or cash rental rate, uh, renegotiating cash rental rates here in the last few years. Really strong response. Now here's a slowdown here. Here are a few select states that have seen farmland values drop from the highs to here where we saw in 2007 in South Dakota coming in at 10% off from its highs. Again, Kansas and Nebraska are both above that at 12 and 13%. But again, it reinforces this idea that we talk about these national trends. Unfortunately, uh, debts in the farm economy and, and uh, bills and income aren't paid at the national level. Uh, they're paid at the farm level. And when we start looking at state and county differences, it's important to keep that in mind. So uh, where are we at sort of here in the ag economy? We're definitely uh, in this margin squeeze period and starting to maybe hit this recovery period. And what do I mean by that? I told a lot of folks in the Corn Belt that if they want their situation in the Corn Belt to get better, they need to watch what's going on in the Great Plains. They need to watch what's happening with wheat. And the wheat situation has been really bleak. That's why we saw a lot of decrease in farmland values, especially in Kansas and Nebraska. Really tough situation for wheat. So we, uh, I think in 2018, when we saw wheat acres actually increase just a little bit, that was good news for the farm economy. It sort of stopped pushing additional production in the corn and soybeans. Of course, uh, the other side of the story is if we have a big a hiccup in trade, uh, if we see a big slowdown here in trade and a decrease in demand or a decrease in usage of corn and soybeans, that could be a really big headwind for the farm economy. And we might not be as far down this roller coaster slide as we might have initially hoped. I sort of think uh, 2018 could kind of be an inflection year for the farm economy, broadly speaking. It's either the point where farmland values and cash rental rates start to turn higher, which we've seen some evidence of in, in Iowa and in different parts of the Corn uh, Belt, I believe Kansas even, reported higher cash rental rates here this spring, or we're gonna face additional consolidation and conditional uh, squeeze in the budgets heading into the 2019 and 2020. A lot of uncertainties. So let's talk about a little bit of opportunity. Let's talk about opportunities, and I see a few opportunities uh, specifically with livestock. This is total red meat and poultry consumption. Uh, this is on a per capita basis, pounds of per, per capita consumption from 1970 to 2018. And as you can see, we were trending up pretty consistently over time, and then we had a big drop. Anybody want to guess what that drop was? What's that? Uh, that's potentially part of it, but what was going on? This is, this is all meat. The recession. The recession had a pretty big impact. Of course, to your point, there was also a drought in Texas, and they were consolidating the herd and, and, and liquidating the herd in 2010 and 2011, so that didn't help the situation ever uh, also. But this is total meat, and there was a big hiccup in meat consumption. In fact, it's really interesting, because we what took us from 1990 to 2008, 28 years, or 18 years, excuse me, uh, 18 years of growth from about 200 to 220 pounds of per capita consumption, we washed out in about four years. Or, excuse me, five years, okay? And now we've rebuilt that same amount in about four years. There was a lot of questions three or four years ago about where that curve was gonna go. Was it gonna keep going lower? Was it gonna flatten out? And was it, or was it gonna have a really slow, slow recovery? And it's been a slow recovery, but we actually recovered a lot faster than I think any of us would have thought three or four years ago. So this is good news. I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, positive outcomes from additional consumption of red meat. In, in poultry. Here's a recovery for beef. Uh, this is from 1970 to 2018. Uh, as you can see, there hasn't been many periods in history where per capita beef consumption has recovered. We haven't seen very many of those at all, but actually we're on one of the biggest recoveries since the 1980s. There was a spike there in the 70s. 
but sort of an early recovery, uh, moving from about 55 pounds a few years ago, closer to 60. Uh, it's interesting, um, on the surface, it seems like we attribute all this to us eating steak, uh, human consumption of steak. The uncertainty here is that the USDA doesn't actually measure how much meat individuals eat. It's a disappearance. So they add up how much meat we had at the beginning of the year, how much we imported, how much we exported, how much is left at the end of the year, and that remainder is what they call disappearance. So I grew up in eastern Kansas, and our primary outlet for our grains were dog food manufacturers in southwest Missouri. Uh, a lot of dog food got made in southwest Missouri. <laughs> so a big change has happened here in the last few years is we don't have as much demand for dog food consumption. Why? A company called Blue Buffalo came to town. They make a lot of dog food. I hate to admit it, but my wife and I actually buy the dog. My wife orders it, and I don't make much of a protest. What makes Blue Buffalo dog food special? Grain-free. They, they don't use the sorghum or the corn or the beans or the wheat that my family farm operates. And in fact, one of the local elevators has rented out half of their entire capacity to Blue Buffalo. And Blue Buffalo works with producers in Nebraska and the Dakotas and, and Wyoming and, and Montana to bring in legumes and pulses to help. By train, they ship them out here on a short line train to help build their demand. Well, there's another source of uh, that they need to get their dog food in the right place, and it's actually meat. So how much of that uptick in per capita meat consumption, how much of this uptick in beef consumption might be a different product than we're used to, might be dog food. Uh, so something to keep in mind, we typically think about food consumption as humans, and, and it could be a little bit of a shift here. We don't actually know how much of that is sort of traditional humans versus uh, maybe a non-traditional source for our, our meat proteins. Uh, here's the cow herd. Uh, Dr. Roberts will talk about this a little bit. Uh, we saw the cow herd really drop here uh, in the late 2000s and started to uh, build a bit of a recovery in, in recent years. I want to point out one part of this is in blue here is the share of the U.S. herd that each state represents. So uh, Texas accounts for about 25% of the beef cow herd. Uh, Oklahoma accounts for a little more than uh, 6%. And uh, South Dakota down here accounts for 6% as well. The orange bar accounts for how much of that recovery, that beef herd recovery, each state accounts for. And as you can see, Texas is almost 25% of the recovery. So while they only account for 15% of the herd, those expansion has been about 25%. Interestingly, uh, South Dakota's share of this has actually increased from about 4 to 5% during the collapse to now almost 6% because they've been expanding faster than other states. And this is, uh, we typically think about this expansion and contraction in the beef herd as sort of cows come in, cows come out, but they don't come in and they don't go out in the same place. And actually Texas, while it accounts for 25% of the expansion, they were more than 35% of the collapse. So Texas is recovering much faster than the rest of the country, but they collapse at a much faster rate. It's about half a million head is what they're short uh, during their expansion recovery. So keep an eye on Texas. What's going to go on in Texas uh, could be a big indicator how much the U.S. herd continues to expand. So uh, one of my last slides here is going to be the beef global scorecard. Thinking about the future and where the future for South Dakota uh, producers might lie and, and global producers, there are three key elements to beef I want you to look at. Consumption. The U.S. is the number one uh, consumer of global beef accounts for 20% of uh, global beef consumption. It's quite impressive when you think about 300 million Americans and uh, 7 billion people. <laughs> we are consuming a lot of beef uh, relative to our, our population. However, the growth of this is 0.2% annually. So if you want to think about your, your, the future of your operation, and thinking about growing your operation, you're going to need to rely on more than just U.S. consumption. 0.2% uh, uh, over almost 28 years is a really slow expansion. China, on the other hand, is about 13% of global consumption. Uh, the U.S. consumes about 60 pounds, 60 to 70 pounds per capita uh, of beef. China is about 12. The, nat the global average is 17. So they're well below global average. Uh, but because of their large population base, they're 13% of global consumption. They're increasing at a 7.8% annual growth rate. 
So the rule of 72 says you divide, take 72 divided by the interest rate, and that'll tell you how long it takes to double. So 72 divided by 7.8 means in less than 10 years, if they keep that consumption trend up, China beef consumption will double. So we're talking about a decade from now, China could be the number one consumer of beef as a country. Again, it's not going to be on a per capita basis. It's going to be a lot of people, uh, and it's going to be a very interesting story to keep in mind. Uh, production, on the other hand, U.S. is, again, 19% of global production, a very slow growth rate, 0.3% of annual growth in production. Brazil, on the other hand, in second place at 15%, 2.4% annual growth. It's not that big of a growth rate, but it is much bigger than the U.S.'s. So if those continue over the next few decades or the several decades of your career, it could be a different story as to thinking about the number one consumer and the number one producer of, of beef. China imports... Uh, they're the number two importer right now, and they account for 11% of global imports. This is a graph that I want to leave you with to think about. This is very similar to the soybean graph, if you think about it. The gray bar and the yellow bar are almost completely together. And then about 2014 and 2015, what happened? Consumption outpaced production in China. And this green bar, which was non-existent through the 90s, started to pick up. And then by 2015, it got to about 9%. And in 2017, it's above 10%. The question we have to ask ourselves is, where is China today about beef consumption? Is 2018 the equivalent of 2007 for soybeans? Uh, there could be a lot of opportunity thinking about strong, documented strong periods of growth in their consumption, thinking about they've sort of plateaued here for production. They're turning to the markets for imports. A big story, of course, for last year was whenever we had our first U.S. meat or U.S. beef headed back to China, and U.S. beef is on the shelf in China, uh, and, and it's going to be an important part of that story. A lot of this is talking about trade and trade relationships. I think a lot of it came down to economics and supply and demand, and they needed it. They needed U.S. beef to help fill their needs. So there could be a lot of opportunity for, for beef. Of course, uh, given the current trade situation, we have to really wonder what's uh, in store. I'm going to leave you with a couple unknowns uh, to think about. Uh, trade. How long does the tr current trade situation continue? How severe are any implications or fallout that might happen? What happens with the global economies? The global economies actually are growing pretty strong. Uh, we've had strong global economic growth over the last two years. That's been good for consumption. It's going to be a good story. We'll see how long it stays out. The U.S. economy, we've had a, a long history here of low inflation, low interest rates, and pretty stable wages. Uh, with the, in light of the new tariffs and tariffs on different products, how long will that continue? That's a big uncertainty moving forward. And I'll leave you with one quote before I pass the mic off here. Donald Rumsfeld uh, gave this quote uh, kind of during the height of the situation in Iraq when it wasn't going well, and he caught a lot of flack for this. But actually, it's pretty insightful if you, if you dissect it. As we know, there are known knowns. These are the things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. These, this is to say we know there are some things that we don't know. That's the list I just showed you, okay? But here's what's the really tricky part about agriculture and today. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if I were to guess, I think there are more unknown unknowns lurking today than what there might have been a year ago or two years ago. Uh, and so I think it's really important to keep that in mind. There could be a lot of hiccups and a lot of surprises, some adverse, maybe some positive. But well, we've got to keep those in mind and always think about, okay, what do I know I know? What do I know I don't know? And then how do I build contingency plans for the unknown unknowns or uh, position myself for potential opportunities? So with that, I will pass the mic off. for that, David. Um, yeah, it, 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 it was great to finally meet David. I've certainly read uh, about him. We um, or read his, his work and, and um, his company's work on, on a number of occasions. Um, and so it's, it was very interesting to meet him. We actually uh, bumped into each other uh, yesterday in the hotel, went out to dinner. As you might not be surprised, it was perhaps the world's most boring dinner, uh, as two economists have kind of this long lost reunion. Um, what I want to talk about, obviously, is challenges and opportunities in the current agricultural economy. 
Now, let me start by saying that in one way or another, I've worked in the commodity market since uh, 1995, January of 1995. I can, in fact, trace it. Uh, my second day working as a commodities broker in 1995 was the day that Barings Bank fell over. Uh, I was working in Europe, and so if you were in the futures markets at that time, it was, it was a very exciting time. Uh, it was a very memorable time to, to be working in it. And in that amount of time, uh, and so in those, those 23 years, there's never been a time in which I feel less equipped uh, to say something intelligent about what's going on in the agriculture markets than now, all right? So I, I, that's my caveat to start out. Uh, now, as a, as a professional economist, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna try. I mean, that's also my job, right? Um, but that is, I think that right now, as, as David sort of summed up with that Rumsfeld quote, there, whether we're talking the known knowns, the known unknowns, or the unknown unknowns, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty here. Uh, and in a way that I don't think the U.S. markets, agricultural markets, have really had to deal with it for at least a decade and really maybe multiple decades. So, um, quick question. Who was at this last year in Aberdeen? Okay, in advance, my apologies. Okay, some of the slides will be the same. Uh, hopefully, not too many of the slides will be the same, and even fewer of the jokes will be the same. But there will be a little bit of overlap, and that is because I do think it's important in understanding where we're at right now in the world. And the part that I do want to start with, I started with last year, I know, I start almost all agricultural talks with these three slides. And these come from a website called ourworldindata.org. It's a fascinating, fascinating website, collections of data, graphs, explanations of their origins. Um, but they have a whole section on poverty and on global poverty. And this is one of the charts in there. And this is the percent of the world's population that lives in extreme poverty. That's $1.90 a day in purchasing power parity in 2015 purchasing power parity. So $1.90 a day in 2015 purchasing power parity. We go on the left side of this and what we see is in the 1820s, 90%, uh, 85 to 95%, depending which study you look at, of the world lived in extreme poverty. All right, well, we all remember like high school English, we read Oliver Twist, we know the world sucked back then, that's not a surprise. But then you go and you kind of move to the right, and if you see where that black line starts, that black line starts in 1980. In 1980, 44% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Okay, so now we're in the lifetimes of most of us in this room, 44%. We go to 2000, 30% of the world lived in extreme poverty. By 2015, we estimate 9.5% of the world lived in extreme poverty. So from 2000 to 28, or 2015, we went from almost a third of the world living in extreme poverty to less than a tenth. Okay? We can put this, now I, I've taught statistics uh, on campus for many years, one of my favorite classes to teach, basic stats. Uh, and so I know with percentages we can do a lot of weird things. And so this is the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty around the world. That red is number living in, the green's number living above that $1.90 a day threshold. We go to 1980, we had roughly 2 billion people living in extreme poverty in the world. And we had just over a billion living outside or above that threshold. By 2015, we had about 700 million living in extreme poverty and 6 billion living above it. Okay, again, 1980 to now. The reason this matters and the reason I start every talk I give in agriculture with these slides is because it is fundamental human nature that when people get wealthier, they eat better. This is not an American thing. This is not a Western sieve thing. This is human nature. When you get a raise, when you get a promotion, when you finally sell those, those $13 beans or that four and a quarter corn, what do you do? You go out for a nice dinner, right? You celebrate with food, you have a steak. Right? When 
The prodigal son returned. What was the first thing his father did? Killed the fatted calf. Right? What are some of our fond memories? Fourth of July or Christmas or Thanksgiving or sitting down with those meals. We celebrate with food. That's human. And so as we get well to the globe, the reason it's important to understand for agriculture is when we get wealthier, we eat better. And I would argue almost every single good and bad thing that we face right now in agriculture starts with this chart, starts with wealth. If we're talking about this commodity super cycle we just went through, it's all driven by wealth, whether that's Chinese import demand, uh, whether that's biofuel demand. Where did biofuel demand come from? All right, came from trying to support farmers. We have the money to do it. It came from air quality interests, from environmental perceptions, water quality regulations, a lot of environmental regulations. Where did those come from? They come from wealth. Newsflash, go to Venezuela, environmental, environmental um, enforcement, much weaker. North Korea, EPA, not a very strong agency, right? When you're starving, water quality, air quality matters a lot less. We see it in this country as well as every country. That's humanity. That's normal. All right? So that's why I like to start with these charts. We live in this world of exploding wealth. And that means people are eating better. It's not just more. It's better. People down here, they're adding... People here, they're adding meat. People here, they're adding meat with names like filet mignon. People up here, they're adding organic tofu. I don't understand it, but that's the world we live in, right? They're adding or food with a story, and we'll come back to that. But this is really important to understand. And so when we turn to China, and we, we China's kind of the poster child of this. It's far from the only country uh, that's seen this big reduction in poverty, but it, it is the poster child. It's had the biggest effect. This is meat consumption in China uh, from 1975 to the present. And so you see uh, that, that kind of teal color uh, is swine consumption, increase in swine consumption over that. And it's, a, it's an explosion. And that is not just imports. Yes, China is the world's largest importer of pork. They're the world's largest producer of pork. They raise more hogs than the rest of the world put together. They're the largest hog operations in the world. In fact, there was an article in The Economist earlier this year. They are now building six and seven hog barns. Multi-story. It has a picture of elevators. They move hogs up and down. Okay? Uh, it's amazing. Now, it does make permitting easier when you have no viable environmental movement. That same hog barn is up on top of a giant hill. Why? Because the waste can run down into the creeks. Okay? Again, wealth. Now, here's the crazy thing. China's now hitting the point where wealth is getting high enough that environmental quality matters. Air quality matters. Water quality matters. These are the things they can do now. If they keep growing like they are now in 10 years, they're not going to be able to do that. We've seen that in Japan. We saw it in Korea in the 60s and 70s. We've seen it in Taiwan in the 80s. All right? Again, it's driven by wealth. But so tons of animals there, not just pork, but also beef, also poultry. But if you're going to raise that many animals, you've got to feed them. Uh, this is uh, oilseed consumption uh, in China, how that's changed from 1990 to the present. And this ugly, and I'm sorry these colors are a little ugly. Uh, you know, when you're at the university for 15 years, you try to be inclusive. This is a, a colorblind, friendly color palette. Uh, I, I'm not colorblind, so I don't know if it helps. But I know when I look at them, I kind of wish I was. So my apologies. Um, but so this kind of ugly color right here, this is soybean growth over that time period, over that 18-year time period. You see massive growth. And it's not just, we started hearing about it in kind of uh, that 2002, 2003 era. Uh, that's when we started hearing about Chinese soybean growth. But in reality, it started in the early 90s. The growth was happening for a decade before we really realized it. But just like David talked about in the commodity cycle, uh, we were in a period of vast oversupply. And so that, there was still rapid growth there, but it was still small compared to global supply. And so it took it a decade to really suck up that supply and get to a point where it started to affect global prices. 
So where we are right now, and we talk about the, the backdrop we're in, the good news is we're finally at the point, and, 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 you know, and David showing that roller coaster, what I've been saying for the last few years is, you know, there's gonna be three to four years of low commodity prices of this trough of we work o off this surplus, Get back to where demand takes over and it's what we go. And we're seeing it here. You know, corn, we've got two years in a row of corn, these black bars, global stocks or global numbers or stocks use two years in a row of significant declines in global corn inventories as use is outstripping production. And that's what we've wanted to see. We're seeing Okay, um, we're not seeing a corn, we're not seeing rat in ethanol in the United States. Pretty flat. Again, policy. We'll see what happens with a lot of the policies coming out of the EPA surrounding the renewable fuel standard. Um, we can talk about it more if you want later. The latest, the 2019 RVO rulemaking, I believe. Um, the good news is, I think it's inherently, the good news if you're a corn producer. For those of you who are livestock, my apologies. Spent 15 years at Ohio State doing grain work. So I get a little, my natural inflection is like high prices, high grain prices, good. Low grain prices, bad. My apologies. I know livestock producers, it's the opposite. But we can still be friends, all right? I promise. Uh, you're, trust me, livestock tastes way better than the grain. So... We've got that that we can agree on. So I do believe that will ultimately be repealed, uh, but it has to go through the courts. Um, we are seeing some growth. If we don't see that upheld, if we don't see kind of the un continued undermining of the RFS, we are seeing a little bit of growth in ethanol use, not huge. Feed use, we're seeing animal numbers grow. We're seeing a little bit of growth there, not huge. Export growth in corn, this is 1990 to now. Where's that trend? Okay, it's pretty sideways. And so our corn growth is really driven by incremental ethanol growth and a little bit of incremental feed growth, maybe a little bit of incremental export growth, but there's not a lot of inherent consumption growth uh, for U.S. corn. Okay, that's where we're at. And I, I'm not saying it's good, I'm not saying it's bad, it just it is where we're at. Uh, in corn. According to a study that a, a former colleague of mine did, uh, we're growing yield at about 1.75 bushels to the acre. We're growing demand in corn at about 1.25 bushels to the acre. So an extra half a bushel per year per acre uh, is, is coming into the market. Now, in reality, a half a bushel a year in a given year doesn't matter much. Mother nature matters a heck of a lot more than that. And after years of, of increased acres, of high yields, uh, and that oversupply, we finally started to see that even come down a little bit. Two years of declines in inventories, um, finally pulling corn stocks back to an area that would be moving, which I think if we go back uh, a mere two months, eight weeks, 10 weeks ago, We'd be looking at, looking at prices saying, all right, 2018 new crop prices, that's shaping up. We're going to finally probably be able to build some balance sheets on the grain side. And now that's gone away. The fundamentals are there. We'll come back to trade. But the fundamentals are still there to build balance sheets uh, on the corn side. Um, the long-term issue, no export growth in 30 years. Uh, ethanol is giving us a little bit of growth. Uh, it's much slower. That yield, like I said, 1.75, where are we going to put that corn? Particularly when demand growth is, is, consist, is considerably slower. Okay, I'm going to come back and, and try and answer that a little bit, and then, then we'll talk about the good news. All right, uh, Soybeans. Soybeans, uh, this is where we've seen the explosive growth uh, in demand globally. Um, protein demand, particularly driven by poultry and swine demand in developing countries, uh, those have much more protein-centric meal or much more protein-centric rations. That's why we hear so much more about oilseed demand than we do corn and wheat demand. We hear about China growing, and we hear about all these 
all these other countries growing. They're more efficient, birds, hogs, more efficient converters of plant protein into animal protein. So they have a meal protein heavy ration or a, a vegetable protein heavy ration. And so we've seen this demand go up, but once again, two years in a row, down here at the bottom, those black bars declining two years in a row. We're finally starting to see that tighten up a little bit and hopefully move back towards a period of, of sort of more normal profits in agriculture. What's the driver? Exports. Driver of US soybean, we know this, we've heard it, particularly in the last eight weeks, is our exports, and those are primarily to China. Now, with everything that we've seen over the last four weeks, what does it mean for these? And that's where I say, I don't know, okay? And, and I'll be real frank here. I spent a number of years of my career thinking I could outsmart the markets, okay? That I could predict the markets, and I'm here talking to you. So figure out how that went, right? <laughs> Why? Because predicting prices is really hard. And you know what's harder than that is predicting politicians. And the problem is that right now, is that bad like mojo to say at the governor's ag summit? I don't mean it to be offensive. I say it as simply as an economist. But right now, this is driven, what we have is driven by politics and not simple economics. And that makes it very difficult to talk about what we're going to see as we move through the remainder of this marketing year into the next marketing year. And so when we talk about this in Chinese soybean imports, you know, this is really where the demand growth has been globally. It's not only China. Again, they're the poster child. It's Indonesia. Brazilian domestic demand has grown really fast. Uh, there's been a lot of demand growth globally for that. But with the trade spat that we have seen unfold uh, in the past eight weeks, since late May when it appeared there'd been a breakthrough between China and um, the, the Trump administration, uh, we've seen that really unravel. We've seen beans come off about $2. Uh, we've seen corn come off about 70 cents. Why? It's some mixture of, of weather and it's some mixture of trade. Which is which? It really depends who you're asking and frankly where they sit on the political spectrum is my experience. All right, but it's it, honestly it's some of both. Okay, we have some trade worries here. We've had good weather through most of the of the country right now. Um, some observations, export demand on soy was used to be the one bright spot. Um, what David said, this study that, uh, again, a former colleague of mine did, um, he estimated that soybean, Chinese soybean import demand had two and a half times the impact that U.S. ethanol demand did in, in the commodity super cycle. The Chinese import demand was two and a half times greater than, um, than American ethanol demand for driving global crop prices. And afterwards, you want to talk, I'm happy to point you to it or talk you through it. It's a really simple uh, set of numbers to understand. Uh, so this was a huge driver. Are these price declines we're seeing, are they trade or yield? We're going to find out. Okay, we're going to find out as we move through this year, we see yield. I mean, soybeans are so far from made. Even corn is so far from made. Uh, we do see the market clearly pricing in all the bad news. And it's a weird thing to happen in July. Okay, that's the oddity here. As somebody who's watched markets, it's not typical that you see really sharp, significant price declines in June and July. It's not unheard of, but this sort of change is a little surprising. And that's what I think justifies saying, yeah, a lot of this, my guesstimate, half to two-thirds of this is trade. A third of it, maybe, maybe a half, a third of it is my guess, is yield. Two-thirds of it is probably just trade worries. Um, China can reduce, and, and there's a lot of talk about this. When we go to q and I'm happy to answer questions. There's this idea that China can't reduce their soy consumption. But here's something to realize. In 2008, the United States reduced its soy meal consum consumption by 7%. In, 2018, in 2012, we reduced it by 8%. 
7 or 8 percent decline in soy meal consumption by China converted into bean imports is around 180 to 200 million bushels. And if that's coming from the United States, that's, that's huge. All right. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but the idea that we can just be sanguine about this, that this, they have to have the beans, they, they can't work around it, it's, it's not that simple. All right. You know, it doesn't mean that they're going to embargo the United States, that our, import, that our exports to them drop to zero either. But the idea that this is costless and there are costless ways around it is trivially wrong. That falls into the category of known knowns. Economists, we know what we know when it comes to trade and tariffs and the impact of tariffs. And we can lay it out pretty easily. Okay? Wheat, you know, wheat, um, here's domestic use. I mean, I think I said it last year, you know, what's the demand story over the last two decades in corn? Ethanol. Ethanol, thank you. I taught economics at Ohio State 15 years. I can withstand an awkward pause after a question longer than anybody in this room, I assure you, right? What's the demand story in soybeans? China, right? What's the demand story in wheat? That's the, that's the typical answer. It's not actually correct. Thank you for playing. Man, didn't you hate teachers like that? <laughs> like, I tried to answer, and he just shot me down. There have actually, there's not just a demand story in wheat. There have been two demand stories in wheat. What do you read about wheat when you open the papers? Do you hear about wheat? If you open the New York Times or Washington Post or, like, online or, or Wall Street Journal, what, do you, what are we reading about? The foodies. Gluten. Apparently, gluten, like, kills us early or causes baldness or something really bad, right? That's the first one. What's the second one? Low-carb diets. Atkins, right? Scientists tell us if we, one group of scientists tell us if we just eat more bacon and less bread, we'll all lose weight. I can at least live with those scientists, right? <laughs> but so we've had two demand stories in wheat over the past three decades. The problem is they've both been negative. Wheat's really been on the short end of the demand story, okay? And I'm not, I'm not taking sides in any of those. I'm simply saying, and we can see it really clearly when you look at price and quantity data in wheat, it has not had the benefit. And so we look at domestic use completely flat, and that includes feed use, okay? And in fact, feed use has been growing over this time because human use, human food consumption in the United States has been declining in wheat. Exports have been declining. Why? Because we do a pretty good job of producing wheat, and most of the biggest importers of wheat are very price sensitive, and they're happy to take it out of the Black Sea, okay? And we're, we're harder to, to compete there. The good news is, good news, again, from a, from, a, from a wheat grower standpoint, the decline in acres over the past couple years and the smaller harvests, particularly in the past two years, have meant we've radically pulled down our inventories. This year, on June 1st, we estimated we had over six months of consumption, over half a harvest, in storage, right as we started the 2018 harvest. We're finally pulling that down to a much more manageable number. Okay, And so that's the good news on wheat. Um, there's too many producers in wheat, you know, globally. It's very hard to see big numbers. Um, what, these prices that we've seen, really, this, this strengthening in prices over the last six months is not driven by fundamental change in demand. It's driven by the fact that globally we're starting to see those supplies come down. We're starting to see things shift out of wheat acres. Okay? So what's the good news? I feel like, you know... I feel like now that I'm independent, I'm not part of the university, I'm, you know, kind of paycheck to paycheck, I've actually been, and I know what's ahead of me over the next six months in place, I've actually been kind of reaching out to see if I can get sponsored by Prozac, because I feel like that's actually going to be the best to sponsor an economist talking about the market. Um, is a time that is very depressing when we look at what's happened over the past four months. All right? It's not all bad news. The big picture stays intact. The big picture is one in that, and this is why I encourage you, go look at our world in data. What it's driven is data. 
is numbers. If you spend half an hour to an hour going through there, going through the sections on poverty, on war, on lifespans, what you'll see equivocally, contrary to what social media tells us, contrary uh, to what CNN and MSNBC and Fox News are living in the most prosperous and, in fact, peaceful times in human history and the wealthiest time in human history. It doesn't feel like it, but when you look at numbers, it's clear, and there's no arguing with it, all right? And so as in agriculture, that's the biggest story, and that's the good news. Globally, the three richest countries uh, in the world. So basically, take out Western Europe, take out the United States, Canada, and Australia. And this is the distribution of wealth in the rest of the world from 81 to the present. Bottom two, orange and, and red, those are the extreme poverty that we talked about before, that nearly 2 billion people uh, in 1981. And then that, you know, half of, or maybe a billion and a half above that. And then you go out to the right, and what you see is how many more people, and again, this is outside of the Western world, now live above that. The amount of money that's, that's out there, not just outside the Western world, but inside the Western world. We look in the United States, okay? The opportunities here are unprecedented. U.S. wealth continues to grow, just chugs right along, chugs right along, right? So what's the good news? We live in a wealthy time, peaceful and prosperous time. Look at the numbers, convince yourself of that. That's the biggest antidote to the times that we live in. And consumers now relate to food as an identity, okay? I mean, people are starting to assume, which is weird, food preferences is part of their identity. Like, I grew up in southwest Missouri, small town. If you ask, what's my identity? You know, I'm small town, Southern Baptist, Chevy dealer son. That was my gr identity growing up. Look at my build, it's clear why, why there were no sports included in that, right? That was my identity. But now, people's identities are, you know, how many people's identities relate to their food? How many people, when you ask them, you know, when you look at like their social media profile, have a vegan or vegetarian or paleo or something, we may look at that and it just kind of blows our mind, but you know what they're saying? They're saying, I care enough about my food, I'm willing to pay a ridiculous amount of money to add these adjectives to my life and build my life around it. And guess what that says about their willingness to pay? It's going up. Safe, affordable food. In this room, commodity, production, historical production, agriculture, we've talked about safe, affordable, abundant food. We're in the 21st century. Bragging about safe, affordable, abundant food is like Delta bragging, we don't crash much. It's not a winner, guys. We live in a world of wealth and expectation and luxury, and that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity. Uh, like I said, foodie, all this stuff, this identity. There's lots of other. We now live in a time in which we can segment food. I've got a neighbor who pays on a subscription like six dollars a month or six dollars a dozen for eggs. Okay, comes straight from the farm. They still have the chicken poo on the eggs. Okay, that is not a bug, that's a feature because it shows just how fresh they are. Now, you, we may all sit and go, really, I think I paid 99 cents a dozen last time I was at Kroger. All right, A, how long have we bemoaned the small share of consumer dollar that hits the farm gate, right? Anybody in here not heard somebody complain about that? How much of that $6 do you think hits the farm gate? 100% because no processor is going to ship poo-covered eggs, right? Right? Especially when we, you know, and I'm not going to say it because we, you know, that guy in the back is in charge of the inspectors, right? But this gives us these opportunities to segment out markets, to take basically food. What we've talked about is commodity food for generations, for centuries, for millennia, and start segmenting it out. I grew up as a Chevy dealer. Okay, Chevy dealer's kid. You know, you can buy a work, a work truck, half-ton work truck, two-wheel drive, cost you $22,000. You can buy a half-ton, high Sierra, 
four wheel drive, you know, everything on it for $85,000. Do we mock the person who's buying that $85,000 half ton? All right, we do a little bit, but not the ones buying the LTZs, right, that are 65,000. Why do we have that? We have it so different consumers can consume basically the same product at different price points. We live in an era in agriculture where this is the good news because we now have not only the ability to do it, but we have the pricing. So let me just hit the last, that's the good news. <laughs> and that I'm finished. The economists are done. So you can get to the important stuff. Of course you will. Well, thank you, and I think I learned my mom needs to triple the price she's selling her eggs for and stop washing them because she can make a lot more money. Um, so we'll now open up to the floor to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, we do have Terry is going to be running around with the mic back there. Um, so if you have a question, raise it. We'll also accept questions from Twitter, so please tweet at us at SD Agriculture using the hashtag SD Egg Summit. So, does anybody have a question? How much of the reduction oh, we, we got the mic. Sorry, got to wait for it. How much of the reduction in soy meal is perhaps the increase in uh, DDG? Is there any data for that? You mean in the years that I pointed out or overall? Overall. overall. Um, that's a that's kind of a, a it, it's a slippery number to get our hands on, and the reason is because DDGs has evolved, uh, particularly with the extraction of corn oil in the last five six years. Um, I would tend to to roughly guesstimate it started out at about half and is probably reduced to maybe a third as that's been extracted, as that soy as the corn oil has been extracted. Um, but it's it's. As you know, it's, I mean, across species, across different, so the only way we get at those numbers is really to kind of do um, economic models of it, statistical models, and they're a third, maybe a half, but it's a really, there's a wide band of confidence, and I wish I had a better number than that. Other questions? I'd like to hear some comments on the commodities futures market. Many of us feel that these markets are not regulated very well, and the, these prices are, are driven hard to figure out, for one thing, but also distortions in uh, prices, especially in the cattle market. And uh, I'd like to just hear your comments. Both of you have been around long enough, I think, to have a view on it. but. So, boy, I was, I had lots of intelligent things to say right until you went to the cattle markets. Um, no, and I, I'm joking. Um, the cattle markets in particular, so I am one that, um, I do not believe that regulation um, is where it needs to be. Unfortunately, the people regulating, and I spent a year at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission in the office of the chief economist. Um, the, although the origins of the futures markets are in agriculture, very little of the regulatory apparatus has any understanding of agriculture whatsoever. Um, it is a, the emphasis is not really on market functioning. And uh, were I not on camera, I would give you some, some very colorful examples uh, that shocked me while I was there. Um, but in the cattle market, the cattle market legitimately poses some very difficult issues to solve, creating a cattle futures contract. And that is because cattle grading is much more subjective uh, because cattle are live and their cost of transportation is, is so much higher, 
um, than other crops. Their storability, as we like to call it, is lower. The basis tends to vary much, much more, and it's harder to arbitrage. And so what that means is futures markets just will never function as well. National futures markets will never function as well for cattle as they do for storable, for more storable commodities. Um, does that mean that they shouldn't exist? No, not at all. But it means that there probably are some opportunities there to improve those contracts, certainly improve oversight. But all of this is also against a backdrop in which we see fewer and fewer cash transactions, which makes it even harder. What are you basing it on, right? Um, and so there, there's some, I don't have an easy answer. I think concerns are very justified. I think the difficulty is I've yet to see a comprehensive set of proposals that really vastly improve the market because there are just some fundamental structural pieces of the market that make it a, a difficult market to, to work. Yeah, I just want to echo that last point about the cash market. The, the futures tool is really supposed to help you in a cash market. And when that cash market's becoming fewer and fewer and less and less participants and less and less activity in that cash market, that futures contract becomes harder. It's more difficult for it to function. Um, I also like to think that sometimes we, so I, I guess that's the technical elements of that contract and the way it works. But then um, there's just kind of sentiment and that also moves prices wildly from here to there. I think we also got to think of sometimes people are just, their expectations wildly shift. And I think we sort of saw that with grain markets here recently is, a couple of weeks, you know, how much of that decline was trade and how much of it was exports, or trade and exports, how much was that weather, but, you know, it was a pretty wild swing in $2, and did, did really the value of the soybeans in, in November drop in $2 in value in, in 60 days? So a lot of it's also untangling the shortcomings of the, the product and how much of it's sort of the, the ebb and flow of the market. You guys talked a little bit about the politics of economics and how trade nowadays is influencing the price of a lot of the commodities. Is there data to suggest that that's a cyclical thing, that certain administrations focus more on trade and how that influences ag economy, maybe directly or indirectly? Or, and I guess in a different phrase, something as structured as the farm bill, does that have a noticeable impact on the ag economy, or is it more of this is a surprise that trade is influencing as much as it is this time around? I don't know anything that research that looks at administration versus administration over time, but uh, I do know that when you look at what happened in the 1970s, that was another, again, uh, that was a boom period, and the 1980s was a slowdown, and, and trade was a very important part of that expansion when Russia came in and bought a lot of wheat in the early 70s, and then again in the mid-70s again. They came back, and then we saw a drop in exports there in the late 70s and 80s. And there's a lot of things that happened there, right? Uh, President Carter put on the embargo, uh, and that was one element of that. And then there's sort of uh, economic headwinds, so the dollar can weaken or strengthen that makes it more or less attractive for ag exports. So there are sort of, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure rhymes. And so when we think about booms and slowdowns in the ag economy, trade typically uh, shows up in, in both columns. Quick clarifying. When you're talking about trade, do you mean policy or the actual flows? I meant it's more kind of like different. The, the, this, if we want to call it a trade war that the yep. Trump administration has enacted, isn't a typical thing. This hasn't happened in the last few decades. I meant more is, is there a history to say that this is kind of a surprise or are people overreacting to the fact that he's initiating this sort of new trade policy that the U.S. hasn't implemented in the past? Um, I think it's hard to say until we, n probably because it hasn't happened in a few decades, and, the, and you know, we do have to go back to the embargo, to the grain embargo, to see it happen in the agriculture markets, although there are certainly exa more recent examples in steel and uh, rubber and, and some other industries. Um, because it hasn't happened in agriculture, and I think because there is 
the end game is not clear. Typically in these previous times when we would see sort of trade issues erupt, there was a clear end game on one side or the other, on the moving party. It was kind of clear, here's what I want. You know, clear, concrete set of steps that were communicated. Here's what I want to lift my actions. And we don't really have that. And I think that that uncertainty is really magnifying the price impact here. And, and the fact that it hasn't happened so long, in so long, I mean, as, as crazy as it is, because I'm not rooting for this, if this were something that happened every decade, all right, you kind of go back and everybody's, you know, most everybody's been through it before, like a drought. Okay, we, we understand that. Most of the people have been through a drought. Something like this that happens every 30, 40 years, the world's changed radically in those 30 to 40 years. Trade flows have tra changed radically in those 30 to 40 years. And the fact that it is our, our in, in the row crop, such a large importer, such a large export destination that is the primary target of this, I think exacerbates these moves. So having said that, has it happened? Sure it's happened. We can go back through the last 100 years, 150 years, and find cycles for and against trade repeatedly, the pendulum swinging back and forth. And this won't be the last time that happens. Hi. Um this is sort of a, a really broad question maybe, but um, when the most recent uh, personal income stats came out, uh, was it just a few weeks ago, uh, farm income was up, or it was down across the, basically the whole country, but it was up in you know, like four states, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, I think Vermont maybe. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys had the insights on why farm incomes showed up in the recent stats here, but maybe not around, uh, around other parts of the country. Uh, so you're, if I understand what you're asking about, sort of net farm income changes from 17 versus a projection for 18 uh, and, and being higher here in North Dakota and South Dakota. I think one of the important parts is thinking about, well, what was 17 like, right? What was that, what was the base period? So last year I think it was really, really tough. Uh, Cow-calf had some, a pretty tough year in 17 and, and wheat was a really tough year and, and uh, it was just a pretty tough year. So I think that particular estimate was sort of an improvement, but it's still over a, on, on a pretty tough number. It's still down. So I think when we think about it's, and we're starting to see some, I think this kind of gets back to the point that we're both trying to make is that kind of 2018, if we just look at the data at the ground, we don't look up at the looming clouds and uncertainties that are before us. If you just look at the data, uh, there's a lot of improvement. So net farm income, both nationally and, and at state levels, was either slightly improving or decreasing at a slower rate than it had been. So I think that's sort of the reflection is more of an improvement on a still difficult number, but not um, sort of a sigh of relief that we've returned to sort of a, a baseline or a steady, stable period in agriculture or a boom era. constantly read in the news about consolidation in the packer industry and large grain industry and uh, there is a suggestion that this has a negative impact on our prices yet by the same token we're in a global market that uh, do you feel that this consolidation is part of that or is it detrimental to us? Rock, paper, scissors, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Great minds think alike, small minds rarely differ. Um, personal opinion here. So any t when you see that consolidation, there's a couple ways that it can impact individual producers, right? Uh, we can see production costs decline. Um, production costs for that company decline as they eliminate uh, duplicative uh, internal parts. Uh, we can see research budgets go up that allow them to do uh, bigger things. Um, and so in theory, uh, at the same time, we can see mark, you know, market power that could be detrimental. Um, I have yet to see, and I've yet to see where it's clearly been an improvement for the individual producer. Um, I cannot rigorously back that up, that is, that is opinion. 
uh, but I've yet to see where it's a clear win. I'm not saying it's a clear loss. I'm not saying I've seen instances where I believe that that market power is being abused, but I'm also not seeing the big advantages that, that are touted in uh, the applications for approval as these go through. So to me, I think it's, it's relatively a wash. What I worry about in the longer run is that consolidation and that reduction in competition. And I do have considerable concerns about, um, for a number of reasons, the consolidation in the ag industry, whether we're talking at the biggest uh, end and, and talking about multinational companies that are merging that produce inputs or seeds, even at the, at the local end. I worry about it among equipment dealers, among co-ops, um, from a concentration of credit risk and a concentration of business risk in their uh, concentration of large farms and how those interact. So I think that there, there's enough concern to go around. It's not yet been clear to me, though, that there are big wins to the individual producer uh, for this kind of con consolidation. So it's interesting to echo your comment. There's sort of the idea that it's going to be good for operations, right? Uh, the, improve the shareholder earnings and streamline costs. And then there's this market power standard oil mo monopoly type of concern. And it's sort of a, a line in the sand as to when you become not competitive enough. And it's the DOJ gets involved and, and determines that. But it's sort of a theoretical line. It's hard to really disseminate who gets benefits and who uh, does not. I also think it's interesting if you look at the literature, maybe from the more of the business side, is typically when there's these big mergers and acquisitions, the thought is, oh, we're going to have a lot of benefits and values, um, but they often find a lot of cases they overpay for the acquisition or the mergers did not have as much cost savings as they initially thought. So it's sort of interesting to look at this more of the business school literature is that these are really complicated and even the benefits to the entities coming together might be very much overstated to sort of get shareholder opinion or to sell the deal, so to speak. So it's an interesting observation. And it's, I think some of the regulated stuff for genetics and herbicides, it gets to be concerning because the barriers to entry are pretty, pretty significant to, for a startup or something to crack into that space. So where do the consequences lie? With the consumer, with the producer, with the companies? Who's at greatest risk? with respect to these mergers? Correct. I think it's the shareholders. Uh, it's, it's, and it's the, uh, <laughs> I think they typically, I mean, I think if, I think a lot of times Aren't these, they doing it because of the shareholders? I, I, so I'm a bit cynical here. I think a lot of times we do these things just to sort of create excitement about the company, and I'm not sure that the actual activity itself is creating a lot of value for uh, the organization. Yes, on the extremes, there are examples whenever the consumer or the buyer uh, gets hurt. But I think a lot of times these things get kind of taken on and they're not as, as, as beneficial as they might seem on the surface and the, the benefits aren't nearly as clear as they are sold to be. Um, so I don't disagree. I'm probably more cynical. Um, I would actually, are, I don't disagree that I think it's bad for shareholders. I think it's potentially bad for everybody up and down, including consumers, producers, everybody. And the main reason I think what drives a lot of these is an incentive mismatch, is when you are a CEO of a, one of these publicly traded companies and you merge ABC with XYZ, you're gonna get an ungodly bonus and ungodly deferred compensation and stock options, which you keep whether this thing goes good or bad. I mean, it is a world of call options, okay? And if you think about it, I mean, for those of you who have marketed, this is exactly what we have. Uh, these are call options. There's no downside. There's lots of upside, and they're granted to many of these. So they have a, if you're one of the executives, you have a very strong incentive. If you're given free call options, and you can manipulate the market underlying, and that means, or, or operate this company, I don't mean this in a market manipulation, but operate this company, you have an incentive to operate that company as riskily as possible. You want a very high variance outcome. You either want this company to take off and make a squillion dollars for everybody, because then you get a two squillion dollars on your stock options, or you want it to go bankrupt, because then you're still cashing your paycheck and you still have your house in Malibu. Right? And so 
I think it's bad. A lot of them generally are bad for everybody. And if there were anything I would do besides a, you know, a more active, and this is always weird for me to say because I'm, like I'm kind of a right-wing dude, but you know, besides a more active Department of Justice that's reviewing these with a higher standard, but also is more active as shareholders who really will hold boards to account and who are happy to turn out boards and CEOs um, who kind of sell these things, whose incentives are completely wrong. And I think that that's, you know, I think that's something, there's a much broader point there for anybody who has employees. Uh, as an economist, I think the number one rule of economics is incentives matter, okay? Um, but that's, I think it poses a danger up and down. And I think we can see um, almost an unlimited number of examples of this in corporate America, whether in or outside of agriculture. Whether it's ag makes no, no difference. Good afternoon, Jeff Simprich with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. Recently, I was able to sit in on a session where our partners at SDSU and NRCS and several others had visited several operations across South Dakota. And they were operations that were pretty diverse. And they were definitely doing things to integrate livestock back on cropland and do some different things. All of those operations that this team of people looked at, I think were being very successful and making some money right now. And what I think the group figured out by looking at their stories was, is that all of them had found some kind of a way to have a niche, right? They were all different, but they had also found out ways to do some production systems that were reducing input costs. Yet those two stories don't seem to come up in many discussions about how we work to make the egg economy better in our state. Wondered if you had any thoughts. I thank you for that comment. I think it's um, one that I've also seen uh, play out across the Great Plains and Midwest, about everywhere you go. There's um, never a lack of producers who are out there pushing the envelope for either technology or business models or uh, finding the consumer niches to really crack out a profit. Um, and it seems that there's even more of them maybe today. I think technology can actually, you're talking about technology and speeding up consolidation and big businesses getting bigger, uh, but it also allows some of these niches to pop up. And so the idea that you can find uh, a, somebody in Columbus, Ohio, who will pay $6 for uh, a dozen of eggs with, with that haven't been cleaned uh, is part of this sort of technological advance. And so I think to the point I th hope we we're both trying to make is that the future in agriculture is still bright. Uh, this downturn in the farm economy is sort of sector wide. We're looking at the big picture, but there are differences when you drill down the operations. I think operators who have um, thought critically about what their individual skills are and how they can bring that to the table and create uh, a profitability for their environment have done really well. Uh, we spent a lot of time, my, my time at Purdue and, and even now, we're thinking about uh, is an average producer, because we make these crop budgets for, I mean, there's crop budgets for South Dakota, or livestock budgets, and it's for an average, economic cost and returns for an average producer. And, and has average become less representative as there's sort of this diversification? And, and, and uh, in the Corn Belt, we see sort of these really large operators that do a lot of tillage, and it's very uh, homogenous across their operation versus maybe a more moderate scale that does um, no-till and cover crops and other, and maybe they're raising a special uh, seed corn, or maybe they're raising a food grade corn, or maybe they're marketing to an ethanol plant uh, exclusively to hit their uh, off, the times when they need uh, the grain brought in over the weekends or a holiday. And so uh, it's sort of interesting to see how this is playing out. I think um, we'll continue to see some diversification in niches, but it's really not like it was in the 60s when everybody had, so I think we think about diversification back in the 60s and 50s and 40s as everybody had a couple chickens, a couple beef cows, a couple dairy, and so that was one level of diversification, and this is sort of a different, it's diversification, but it's still specialization. It's diversified specialized niches. Great question, Jeff, okay. Um, two pieces that I want to address separately. The first is on the cost side. Um, almost ev certainly every young and beginning farmer talk I do, and also every actual grain marketing plan um, 
uh, session I do is starts with cost, knowing your costs, driving your costs as a producer, not just knowing your farm costs. That's no longer enough. It is knowing your costs at the field level. We live in the 21st century. We talk about precision ag. It's time to think about and approach this and embrace precision finance and precision accounting as well. And there's an old maxim in business, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And so driving it down allows you to manage those costs. And this is a, even, even if you're getting into these niches, costs still matter, commodity production, right? And so for me, I am, you know, I preach about it with only a tiny bit of exaggeration. And the tools that are out there are so much easier now to drive that down. And the fundamental reason is, once you start measuring costs as a producer, and in reality, this is, this is nearly costless to do. It's annoying to start out. It's a lot of learning for the producers. And it's learning in an area that many times they don't like to deal with. They like to ignore. They like to, to be stereotypical. They like to let their wife handle it. You know, just you take care of the books. And I know I've talked to many wives who are like, oh, I tried to do that, and he doesn't want to hear it. And that, you know what? And guys, that's on you, okay, to be stereotypical. I know farms that operate the other way as well. Driving those costs down to the field level will be the single greatest thing that those farms can do. On the niche side, um, it is, that is where the opportunity is. Commodity production agriculture will never go away, but the, there's an explosion of niches out there, unprecedented. Why? Because people have money and people want to pay for heritage hogs. I think they taste the same. But then again, I've had $200 bottles of wine and I've had $40 bottles of wine and I think they taste the same too. But if I've got a vineyard and I could sell wine for 200 bucks a bottle, I'm gonna do it, all right? Every other industry deals with this and it's time for us to embrace that. And particularly young and beginning farmers, the ones who have uh, more energy, more hustle, more kind of, they live in this digital age and they have a lot more of that than they do of capital. They have a lot more time than they do capital. Those are the ones who are really need to be exploring this. Where are my opportunities? What can I do? And they need to keep in mind, it's still ag. We all need to keep in mind, it's still ag. Let's not anybody get too uppity here, okay? This is all, we're all in this together and we need to stand together or, or we will fall separately. Um, but it's still ag. And those niches are gonna be more and more important. Your commodity producer, maybe it's seed, maybe it's popcorn, um, you know, maybe it is organic. Uh, large scale crop farms, organic. There's a shortage of organic grains in certain parts of this country, all right? But both of those need to happen. And no matter what choice you make, better farm records, driving that down to the field will make you a better, more profitable, more sustainable farm with a greater probability of passing that farm on to your next generation. Do we have any other questions? And I think on that note, our next panel is all about what local producers have done to add value or diversify with their local items. So we'll get more into that with our next group. Do have, I, I think we're good if nobody has any questions. So thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause.